Hello, everybody. I came to Kensington Tube Station, High Street Kensington Tube Station this morning. Nice sunny day, nice environment. A pret, Lord be praised, right by the tube station. So I sat there at 7 o'clock in the morning, having coffee and a couple of croissants and getting really nervous. And now, oh, Jesus. Um, I'm, I think I'm really lucky to talk about the storage industry. There's so much going on. It's crazy. And it's so inventive. And I get a chance to talk about winners and losers and come out of the office. Generally, these little buggers are busy as hell punching stories out every day. So these guys are saying, thank you. It's a day out. This is great. <laughs> now, I'm going to talk about the things at various levels of the storage industry. Components, devices, systems, software, and so on. And I'm going to talk about what I think are the winning components, winning systems, winning software, losers, try not to be very rude, and then prospective winners and prospective losers. And it's not meant to be systematic. If you want to shoot me down, just go right ahead and shoot me down. I'm a little limited for time, 25 minutes. So if they're quick questions, let's do them on the fly. But if they're not, save them up for the end. So PMR disk drives, per perpendicular magnetic recording, they've been amazingly successful. Let me read you out some statistics here. These are from Seagate. It talks about aerial density. 2009, 400 gigabits per square inch. 2011, 500. 2013, 14, 650. 2015, 16, 800 gigabytes per square inch. I mean, the increase in capacity has been phenomenal. All from flipping the bit vertical and recording inside the storage video. The problem is, it's going to come to a dead stop. Because the bits, the surface bit is so narrow now, so small, that the neighboring bits influence it. And so the bit values can change randomly. The amount of error correction you're going to have to do is going to be out of all proportion to the benefit of it. So this technology is coming to a dead stop. And there has to be something else to replace it. Stop gap has been shingled magnetic recording, overlapping right tracks, and taking advantage of the fact that you need a narrower read track. But it's slow. You have to rewrite blocks of data. Another stopgap, well, not a stopgap really, another massively impressive invention was helium filling disk drives. Because helium's got less friction than air, the disk drives don't have to withstand so much turbulence as they spin. So the platters can be thinner, so you can get more of them inside. Let me read out another little statistic I've got. These are from um, HGST. HGST's 2014 Ultrastar, 7K600, five platters and six terabytes. Now we've got the Ultrastar HE8, 2014, seven platters and eight terabytes. And then we've got the HE10, seven platters and 10 terabytes. It's been an amazing, successful thing to do. Seagate poo-pooed the idea, said it was difficult, helium would leak and so on. It doesn't. The seal's great. Helium-filled disk drives have been incredibly successful. Western Digital's taking the HGST technology into its own disk drives now, and Seagate's going to follow suit. Everything is going to be a helium-filled disk drive in the future. Chris? Yes? What happens when we run out of helium? What happens when we run out of helium? We're going to have vacuum disk drives, Martin. No friction at all. We're going to need even more platters in there. <laughs> Flash has been great. It, the amazing thing to me about Flash is this is a 1947, 1950 invention. It's taken so long. Yet as the process has got smaller and smaller, the error correction has got better, the controller software has got better, Flash is just taking over. And now for performance, distri for performance data, all Flash arrays are it. Virtually the entire world thinks that the performance disk drive is dead. There will be no more 15K disk drive produced, that 10K disk drives are going to go out of production, and maybe with TLC, 3D NAND, and possibly quad-level cell, four bits per cell NAND, 7.2K disk drives are going to face limited life as well. That's maybe fantasy. I don't know. I don't know. Um, a little startup popped up in Ireland the other week, NVM Durance. 
They say they can increase flash endurance cycles by a factor of 7 to 10. That's in combination, additive, to whatever else suppliers are doing with flash drives. So take a quad-level cell flash drive with 3D NAND. Say it's got 300 cycles before it drops dead. Increase that by 10, you've got 3,000 cycles. Ooh. All of a sudden, if you can get the cost per terabyte down all right, you've got yourself a cold storage archive medium on flash. It, you can connect the dots to come up to this idea, which is kind of absolutely amazing. Seagate having a massive effort trying to put heat-assisted magnetic recording into their disk drives. This is to try and get up to a terabit per square inch density in the future. Is it misplaced? A Seagate so much in denial about flash that they don't realise that there's no point in increasing disk drive density, aerial density much anymore at all. I don't know. But this stuff, TLC and 3D NAND, is revolutionising the storage industry. That's the components. We're going the wrong way. No, we're going the right way. Systems. The dual controller array has been phenomenally successful. It is the dominating disk storage architecture. The idea that you can have storage separate from servers with dual controllers to provide high availability and grow your storage estate separately from growing your server estate has been so powerful and it's not going to go away. Your flash arrays are basically the dual controller array reinvented. NVMe over fabrics is a dual controller array brought even closer to servers. The idea that, to my, sorry, this is personal. My opinion might be shit, I don't know. The idea that hyperconverged infrastructure appliances are going to kill storage area networks, to me, is bizarre. They will have their place, I'm sure, because the idea that you can just buy these building blocks and it's so such simpler than having separate servers, separate storage, separate networks and so on is so attractive these days that I'm sure they'll be successful. But I can't see them killing the idea of having shared external storage. Public cloud at scale is proving to be excessively popular. Azure, Amazon, Google, it's just amazing. Dropbox, Box, it's just happened. There's no, there's no withstanding it. Nobody knows how far it's going to go. The extremes is that like electricity generation, it'll all come as a public utility and you'll have the odd standby on the roof of your building, but by and large, everything comes from the cloud. I don't know. But at the moment, there's no convincing stopper to public cloud computing, public cloud storage. All flash arrays, winning system, high performance computing. That's spreading with big data that type of work, commercial organizations are employing high performance computing techniques and companies like Data Direct are having presence in the enterprise and people are bringing out all flash arrays now for high performance computing work. Pure storage's flash system is for that kind of idea. This conversion, hyperconverged idea area is going bananas at the moment. Yes, last week's EMC World, it was full of VX rack stuff. Converge this, hyperconverge that, there's a downside to it. What, what happened with all flash arrays is that gradually, mainstream vendors got their act together and they acquired a few startups or they bought their own and we're now in the second generation of retrofitting flash to arrays like VMAX or FAS or what have you. And these things are darn good, so good that the startups are having problems. XIO has had to scale back its ambitions with all flash arrays because it could cost too much money to build a market position and nobody was willing to give it the money to do that. And I think that in this area too, the mainstream vendors are getting their act together extremely quickly. HPE doing well, Dell, with it, Dell EMC with the VX rack stuff and Dell's own stuff. I think the hybrid array startups are also going to have problems in the future, differentiating themselves, building their market. Winning software, deduplication. 
Do you remember a few years ago, people trying to argue that deduplication was a product and not a feature, or it's a feature? It's everywhere. Deduplication is a done deal. We take it for granted. Virtual sounds. Again, left-hand networks, things like that in the past. The virtual ideas, of having a virtual sound. What a crazy idea. Use it for the odd bit of test and dev. Try out left-hand network sound on your laptop computer. It's all gone mainstream now. EMC's attack blogger, Chuck Hollis, used to kill <laughs> virtual sounds. Now, he loves them. Sync and share. It's be become very, very popular, particularly at consumer level. It is becoming popular in enterprises, but I can't see it growing that much. And it's beginning to be added to mainstream storage arrays. Nexan's last announcement, add connected data as transported to its arrays. It's going to become a feature, I think, rather than a product. Thin provisioning, three parts, revolutionary idea back in the day. It's just taken for granted. It's everywhere. HGS has just announced a performance guarantee for its all-flash arrays. You've got to have thin provisioning involved. It, it's become so mainstream of that. Countering copy data sprawl. This is maybe going to be successful with Delphix and Actifio, but they face a problem. How do they persuade disk array vendors whose devout wish is to sell you disk drives so you can have copies of files on them to sell fewer disk drive arrays? It's going to be an uphill struggle for them, I think. However, as disk drive arrays slowly give way to flash, you don't need all those darn disk drive slots. So I think flash could help Actifio, Delphix, and Catalogic and people like that sell more of their anti-copy data sprawl there. Losers. There have been precious few losers in the storage industry, really. And Novanix, that cloud supplier that went out of business. Exanet. The file thing that Dell picked up for doing peanuts. A few others, Copan and Made, which kind of still survives really with SGI. But by and large, relatively few suppliers crash and burn. And people like me predicting there'll be more crashing and burning in the next few years because the VC money's running out, the mainstream people have got their act together, and so on and so forth. But really, we don't really know. Memorister. There was an algorithm for when the member stuff is going to become popular. It was always going to be the current year plus two. <laughs> <laughs> Remember IBM nano hammers? These little diagrams coming out of Almondon, where you had these little nano hammers hitting some substrate and leaving a dent, and the dent was a bit or not. I mean, what a totally crazy idea. It's, it's like a nanoscale cuckoo clock, isn't it? It's just <laughs> bizarre. Bubble memory. You had this domain of semiconductor stuff with little magnetic bubbles moving around in it. It reminds me of a tape drive, really, doesn't it? It's like you've got one reader and some stuff passing in front of it. In this case, it was magnetic bubbles passing in front of it. And it carries on, this bubble memory idea. We've got racetrack memory, little nanowire with magnetized domains moving up and down the thing. And I don't really know what to think about this stuff. I mean, the physics is amazing, but I'm thinking, it was, it's Ascot soon, isn't it? I'm thinking, there's a race course, right? And you've got stables with horses stuck in them. And then you've got a racetrack with the horses moving around on them. And what do you get? What's the best horse density? Well, it's not the racetrack. Because a horse has got to have space to move into. and leave space behind it for the next horse to move into. Well, if those horses, instead of moving around, stood still, they could get closer together, called stables. I just don't see this racetrack idea. But maybe if your reader is so much bigger than the magnetized domain, then it makes sense to move the magnetized domains in front of the reader. Only we're back to tape drive. And I've been yattering on for so long. Dead. Dead as a dodo. Dead as a dodo. You've got to have data services. Dead until exploit memory comes along. Right. 3D exploit, I think, is going to be monumentally large. NVMe fabrics are going to be hugely large because all of a sudden your external server array gets local direct-to-touch storage speed. 
Server SANS and HCIA will have their place. Object storage, it's like a subversion going on. All of a sudden, the file system you thought you were talking to has got object storage underneath it. And then there's the S3 angle as well. This is gradually becoming more and more popular. I'm seeing these two things happening. If you look at this as a span of latencies with memory processors off to the tape and the cloud, then we've got internal storage on servers, external storage, and then this division between volatile memory and persistent storage. Two things are happening. NVMe over fabrics is coming in. Now, as soon as you have an array with NVMe over fabric connection, instead of moving there, it moves up into here, virtually into the server. The access latency is so fast that as soon as the price comes down, people like Mangstore, E8, Apion, DSSD, their stuff will spread like crazy. Here, in the server, between memory and internal storage, there's this tremendous latency gap just waiting to be filled. An X point is going to fill it. Um, the table I put together, it's just representative. It's not meant to be spot on accurate. If a level one cache reference is half a nanosecond, but we classify it as a second, just in our own time scale, so to speak, and then go down through to a SAN array access at notionally 300 million nanoseconds, then if a level one cache access takes one second, a SAN array access takes almost 20 years. Now, DRAM access is 100 nanoseconds, 0.1 microseconds. Let's see now here. An SSD read, a PCIe SSD read, 110 microseconds. So that's a thousand fold difference. The late X point has got a seven microsecond access latency. Now, Intel and Micron aren't giving us read and write splits. They're just saying it's seven microseconds. But even so, that is so humongously fast that you can start thinking, instead of DRAM, I can have X point memory and use that as a cheap form of DRAM. I can have two levels of memory in a system, like a, almost like a non-universal memory architecture. You'll be able to have, if this stuff is priced right, if it does what it says on the tin, and if the system and application software changes, you'll be able to have absolutely massive amounts of data in memory, which the system will churn through incredibly quickly. You can imagine an X point dense server talking to all flash arrays over the NVMe fabrics and everything else just goes off to the cloud with cold storage. Maybe fantasy, I don't know. Losers, kinetic disk drives. I really cannot see it. Okay, so I've got a disk drive with a processor on it and software and it's working with thousands of other disk drives to produce some kind of peer-to-peer -peer object storage with billions, if not trillions, of objects on there, and meanwhile, disk drives are failing. I mean, the complexity is bizarre to my mind. And who wants these things? What, what problem are they solving? You know, disk drives are getting cheaper, flash is getting faster. What object storage problem requires kinetic disk drives to solve it? And the only problem I can see kinetic disk drives solving is Seagate's revenue problem. <laughs> You know, let's transfer some of that array controller stack spend to us. Now, object storage suppliers will support kinetic disk drives. Why not? Whatever sells the software, right? But it's not because their customers are telling them, oh, please, I've got to have this array with 10,000 disk drives in it, all of them being independent, independent object storage nodes. That's what I want. No, they're not. Nobody's telling Seagate that at all. Software only HCIAs, I'm sure they will die. It's a cheap way for vendors to get into the hyperconverged infrastructure architecture space. If you're Novo, if you're Cisco, you've got servers you want to sell, you need software and stuff to sell it with, bingo. Have a meeting in the channel arrangement with Maxter, Pivot3, Simplivity, whoever, as many as possible. It's because you're not ready to commit to the hyperconverged infrastructure appliance market yourself. If you're facing a Cisco salesperson or a Lenovo salesperson and an EMC Dell salesperson, you'll buy from EMC and Dell because it's simpler. NVDIMMER storage memory, 
hasn't worked, won't work until it gets X point on. And then suddenly it starts getting very attractive. I think this storage industry is fantastic. For, for a writer, it's like going gold digging, and everywhere you stick your hand in this pile of gravel and dirt, there are gold nuggets coming out. There are, there are storage startups popping up out of the woodwork virtually every week with the most amazing technologies coming. My little fingertips are saying, thank you very, very much for letting me whitter on myself, express my personal opinions, and not have to thump out stories today. So thank you very, very much. <laughs> So the one theory that I've seen about 3D X point or 3D RAM or 3D you know, NAND as we call it, um, and there's many vendors, Intel's just the first one, there's a half a dozen more coming, is that we're most likely to see it come in as a top of rack and then have an NVMe fabric sharing that storage between servers in the rack. Is that a viable theory from your point of view? Are you are talking about 3D X point or 3D, 3D So you buy a box, so you'd have the top of your rack, you'd have a, an Ethernet not switch. not making a difference. Is it flash? Or flash, is it X point? Yep. 3D X point, yeah. It's X point. Yeah. Well, that's a whole category of 3D flash, yeah. The, the difference between 3D X point mm. is the access is 7 microseconds. And 3D NAND, the access, even fast access, is going to be 100 plus. Okay. So, so 3D X point, the, the theory that I, operating theory I've seen is that there's going to be a box at the top of rack. You'll have your Ethernet switches, and then you'll have a box of 3D X point style memory. And then you'll have an NVMe fabric going down to your servers so they can all share that. It won't be an array. It will be top of rack. Um, there's a company starting up called Drive Scale. And that's more or less the idea they've got. Mm. You have the, the 3D X point, in effect, becomes the SAN. It's just a, it's like a SAN. You know, it, it's a shared resource with a bunch of servers accessing it. Mm. And what sh some, some clever system software will do will provision if you and I are on the same track here. Provision a bunch of servers, provision some networking switches, and provision a bunch of X point, and bingo, you've got some applications set up, VMs or containers and so on. I don't know whether that will happen, but it certainly is attracting a lot of attention from people. This whole idea of a composable infrastructure. Yeah, I don't get I don't believe composable infrastructure is a thing, but that's I believe rack scale architecture might be a thing for a very small number of customers. Yes. And that might make a compo like a pseudo composable in the sense that you blade at a time in a, in a rack scale backplane. Yes. And so you'd have blades of 3D X point, blades of you know, networking functionality. But blades as soon as you start running thousands of applications, then the amount of composing you're doing in the background is absolutely humongous. Yeah, and the system's going to be chasing its own tail. Intel loves it because it sells more chips. Right. And it's a vision thing, it's not a, but I don't believe it's a genuine thing. Yeah. Yeah, I think 3D X point, because you and I have talked about 3D X point before, is just a, a, a true revolution. And the NVMe changes storage networking forever. It'll finally kill yes. Fibre Channel. I hope. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Chris. So you talked a lot about the technology. Obviously, that was the, the focus of your presentation. Um, what about the way that we manage data going forward and how the ability of this technology is going to cause problems for that. And I'll give you an example. Um, we're, we can store a huge amount more data than we ever could. Um, and we want data in different places, because you said the cloud and on-premises. It seems to me that there's a massive opportunity and there's a lot of problems to solve around how we keep our data consistent, how we keep it accessible wherever we want it, how we move it around. So uh, above the, the software layer you talked about, I think there's a lot more opportunity in yes. terms of you, you possibly be thinking of people done. like primary data. They could be an example. Maybe data yeah. gravity. Absolutely. They could the be idea of having this sort of data aware abstraction layer sitting over the top and being the interface to your storage universe. Yeah. The, the, the fun bit is that as soon as you start having heterogeneous systems below it at various levels, then the interface is to the components become complicated and it becomes almost like another version of hierarchical storage management or ILM to my mind at the moment. I can't see primary data succeeding generally because the population of devices and arrays over which it has to exert some kind of control and integration is so vast it'll never finish. 
And there's no industry standard way of accessing these arrays. Not, not that it's worth a spit at a deep integration level. That's why HSM failed. The problem that you're alluding to is, is absolutely humongous. Um, how you solve it, I don't know. It's an opportunity for somebody. How they do it, I don't know. David Flynn and Primary Data, they're really, really clever people. So if, if, if they can't crack it, then possibly nobody can. I don't know. Gavin, did you have something? You're yeah, looking, I've got one more. I know you like looking, a contentious... You're looking like you're going to give birth. <laughs> I know you uh, like a contentious... Oh, I want to get it in. I feel bad for the HGST guys, because I know it's awful when you, someone eats your time slot. Quick one, because you like contentious questions. Can you name one vendor that you think is going to break out and really succeed over the next year? And one vendor that you think is going to get into trouble? Um, one vendor... Oh, yeah, don't worry, don't worry. And I hope they're not in the room, but... Sorry. <laughs> I think EMC's DSSD unit will do incredibly well. Pure may do well with their flash blade as long as they get NVMe access to the damn thing. I think E8 from Israel is going to be another very, very successful vendor. What was the second part of the question? The, the bit that everyone wanted to hear. Which vendor do you think is next to get into trouble? I think that there are several vendors that are struggling at the moment. Um, you look at Armation's results over the past few years, they've gone from being a billion plus dollar corporation a year to be having a $40, billion, 40 million dollar a year run rate with Nexan. Basically, Armation took over Nexan and Nexan is all that remains. The rest of it is just financial engineering junk for some activist investors. Whether Nexan can succeed, I don't know. But they've got Jeff Barrell in charge of them, Mr. Blue Arc, Mr. Drobo, Mr. Connected Data. This guy has got smorey starts big time. So they have a good chance. Caminario. Um, XIO just laid off staff because he can't make it in the all-flash array market. Caminario used to be the performance leader in the all-flash array market. What is it now? I'm sure it's a darn good product and they've got very good people working for them, but times are moving on. Where is it in 3D TLC NAND? Where is it in NVMe drives? And where is it in NVMe fabrics? And if it's nowhere in those three areas, it's going to be left behind. Sorry. <laughs>